We've been discussing this morning that a predicate to surveillance is danger. And in the case of our conference, the idea that immigrants are dangerous. Uh, the poet uh, Solmaz Sharif provides, uh, I think, an apt metaphor for this in her poem, Persian Letters. And, uh, and that's the metaphor of David and Goliath. She writes, uh, quote, David, they tell me, is the one one should aspire to. But ever since I first heard them say Philistine, I've known I am Goliath, if I am anything. So are immigrants Goliath? Are they dangerous? Are they threatening? Are they threats? With us to discuss this, uh, uh, please welcome Alex Noraste from the Cato Institute on the Myth and Reality of Immigrant Criminality. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. It's a pleasure to be here today. I think it's no secret seen from about the time of June 2015 when uh, President or then candidate Trump entered the election that uh, immigrant uh, criminality or terrorism was going to be sort of a focus point or one of the main driving points uh, for some of the opinion, especially amongst immigration restrictionists. So what I decided to do was take a look and a couple of studies that I have here, uh, terrorism and, and immigration, as well as criminal immigrants, where I try to estimate the unlawful immigrant incarceration rates, try to get at what these numbers are. Now, just a few quick introductions before I present these. Uh, there's a lot of public perceptions about what risk is or what danger is or what safety is. There's no such thing as perfect safety. There's no such thing as perfect danger. It's on a continuum. It's not binary. Uh, everything is risky, even in action. Uh, even uh, not taking any actions can be risky. So I think our task is, and this probably shows my biases as an economist, but I think our task is uh, to analyze risk in terms of the costs and benefits of each action to decide how much risk is worth taking. So I would attempt to apply these normal risk analysis numbers to uh, foreign-born terrorism and crime inside the United States committed by foreign-born people. So in order to calculate the uh, terrorism, uh, the risk of dying in a terrorist attack committed by a foreigner on U.S. soil, I just want to run through this very quickly so you know I'm not pulling the wool over your eyes. I basically need to know the number of foreign-born terrorists attacking or planning to attack an attack on U.S. soil. And I didn't include people who are trying to send money abroad, you know, $500 to Al-Shabaab militia or something like that because the administration, the previous administration, everybody's worried about attacks on U.S. soil. They're not necessarily as worried about somebody sending some money overseas. So the damage done to Americans domestically is what I took a look at. For each of them, I took a look at the murder and the damage that they, murders and the damage that they caused in the attack, if they did. The visas they were initially entered, uh, issued in order to enter the U.S. And then the total number of visas issued in all those categories per year. And uh, my broad conclusion is that tourists and other non-immigrants are the most likely uh, to commit deadly terrorist attacks in the United States, not those who come here uh, to settle permanently. So my headline results, taking a look at the years 1975 through the end of 2015, I found 154 foreign-born terrorists uh, in terrorism databases and other sources. They killed a total of 3,024 Americans on U.S. soil. 98.6% of those are on 9-11, so that's 2,983 of those victims occurred on 9-11. During this time, a total of 3,432 Americans were murdered on U.S. soil by all terrorists, including those who are Americans, Amer native-born uh, terrorists. So there is a grain of truth in what a lot of restrictionists say, which is that 88% of all the deaths by terrorism on U.S. soil were caused by foreigners during that time period. But as I'll show in a second, um, the risk is still very small. So your annual chance of dying and foreign-born terrorism uh, committed by somebody in each of these categories. Uh, an unlawful or illegal immigrant, your annual chance, I found one unlawful immigrant who entered unlawfully, who participated in a terrorist attack that killed one person. That means that during this time period, your annual chance of being killed by an unlawful immigrant in a terrorist attack is one in 10.9 billion per year. I don't need to tell you how laughable that is. Uh, you can laugh. Uh, lawful permanent residents uh, killed 10, Amer uh, 10 people in terrorist attacks, so it's about one in uh, one billion per year. Uh, unknown, I couldn't find visas uh, categories for them. During this time period, there were three refugees uh, who participated in terrorist, I'm sorry, uh, three victims of uh, 
terrorist attacks committed by refugees during this time period, all in the late 1970s, one in 3.64 billion per year. Asylum seekers, one in 2.7. K-1 visas, which is a, uh, the, the, a fiance visa that was issued to Tashfeen Malik, who was one of the shooters in the San Bernardino attack in late 2015, one in 780 million per year. And then we get down to the interesting ones. So one of the 9-11 hijackers was entered on a student visa. So that's why, um, and I divided up the, um, the casualties or the deaths on 9-11 uh, equally amongst all the hijackers. So that means your annual chance of being killed is one in 69 million a year. And then now we get down to tourists on a B visa. Uh, because 18 of the 19 9-11 hijackers entered on tourist visas of one kind, uh, that makes them seem the most dangerous at one in 3.8. Uh, five, one in 3.86 billion per year. Now, all together, when you combine these, the, um, the entire chance during that time period of being killed in any year by a, by a foreign-born terrorist is one in 3.6 million per year, which is about 255 times as great, uh, or sorry, one 255th um, likely, basically your, your likelihood of being murdered is 255 times as great in each year in a normal homicide. Now, then we have to compare that to the number of entries on each of these visas per year to try to figure out um, what the actual risk is. So visa waiver program, three terrorists entered. They killed zero people during that time period, but there are 388 million entries on the visa waiver program. So there are about 129 million entries per terrorist on that program. I think that sounds pretty, that's pretty good. That's not that, not that dangerous. And then we can go down the list. There were... 3.3 uh, 3 million refugees admitted during this time period. 20 of them were convicted or committed a terrorist attack on U.S. soil. They killed three people. So that's one terrorist for every 162,000 let in. And you can see that all the way up and down this line on the right, which is the number of visas per, uh, issued per terrorist allowed into the United States. So these are pretty small risks. Now moving to the other side of this uh, coin, other side of this ledger, is taking a look at crime rates. Now there's a lot of I do, there's a lot of academic literature out there about the danger or the likelihood of a foreign-born person being incarcerated in the United States for crime. But the criticism we always get is that that includes legal and unlawful immigrants. You know, it's hard to separate that in the census data. So when I say foreigners are incarcerated at a lower rate overall than native-born Americans, people will say, oh, yeah, but you can't separate out legal from illegal immigrants. It might be that legal immigrants are really peaceful, but illegal immigrants are really dangerous, and you can't separate this out, Alex. So how can you possibly say that they're all right? So we use the residual statistical technique that Pew uh, uses to take a look at the characteristics of suspected unlawful immigrants in the census to try to narrow down who they are in the incarcerated population, to try to get an estimate of who they are. Uh, so it's used not just by Pew, but also by anti-immigration groups like the Center for Immigration Studies. So they both agree on the methods. So we just applied them to a different subset of the census to see how what the incarceration rates are. So we took a look at incarceration rates age 18 to 54, uh, in the United States, this is um, state, federal, all prisons in the United States, including immigration detention. And we found that the incarceration rate for natives is, uh, in that age group is 1.53%. So that's pretty high. I think, as you know, the United States has uh, the highest incarceration rate in the world. We have a bad combination of a lot of terrible laws and a lot of resources to waste. Uh, so we have a very high incarceration rate. Uh, when I narrowed down to unlawful immigrants, uh, to this subset of the population that we took a look at, we found the incarceration was a mere 0.85% uh, of that population in the same age range. So it drops, it's basically 40% lower than it is for natives. And then we drop down to lawful immigrants, which are distinguishable in the census very clearly. And they have an incarceration rate of 047 now, what's interesting is you can tell in the Bureau of Justice Statistics data how many people are incarcerated merely for immigration offenses or how many people are held in detention when they've just crossed the border unlawfully. So what happens is when you subtract them out from the unlawful immigrant population, their incarceration rate drops to 0 0.5, which is about exactly the same as it is for lawful immigrants in the United States. So when people tell me that uh, lawful immigrants or illegal immigrants and lawful ones are 
crime prone and we can't measure it. I'd like to show them uh, this type of evidence that we published in March 15, 2007 in a paper, Criminal Immigrants, their numbers, demographics, and countries of origin, uh, to show them that it's really not the problem that they think this is. And by the way, if you go all the way back to the early 1900s, you take a look at every government commission, usually started to make immigrants look bad, studying this issue. Um, the Dillingham Commission, commissions in the 1930s, even commissions in the 1990s, couldn't mess with the numbers enough to make it look like immigrants are more crime prone. All of them concluded, you know, immigrants are bad, we don't like them, whatever, but they couldn't even trick the numbers enough to make them look more crime prone. Uh, that has continued to this day and this number. So in conclusion, very, very small risk of dying in a terrorist attack committed by a foreigner on US soil. There are 768,000 murders in the United States between 1975 and 2015. 0.4% of that is terrorism. 255 times as likely to be murdered for a homicide per year than in a terrorist attack. And immigrants have lower incarceration rates than native-born Americans do. So I would uh, just throw out there that if you're worried about immigration, if you're worried about immigrants because of the danger to life, liberty, or in private property of uh, native-born Americans, then you should probably worry about other things. Thank you. That was excellent. Um, we have time for one question for Alex. Questions? Uh, yes. Not on. As loud as you can. Yeah, so that number is for foreign-born terrorism. So there, there have been other terrorists in the United States who are native-born who aren't um, counted in that number. My response to that is to read the work of John Mueller, who's a political scientist at Ohio State University, and he runs through the nonsense that DHS funds, that surveillance states do to try to track down uh, immigrants or uh, terrorists. One of my favorite examples is um, the, uh, some government official received an email from somebody saying, give me, and it was a dollar sign, followed by 49 nines in a row, money, or I will bomb you, ha, 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 ha. And the government actually spent resources tracking this person down to like a kid in the Philippines. Uh, so I would say that given the small amount of threats out there, given the small amount of terrorists who actually fulfill them, and given the amount of resources they waste on chasing ghosts like that, as well as the fact that DHS does not do cost-benefit analyses of its anti-terrorism actions to figure out what is an efficient use of these resources, uh, tells me, and the few number of Americans who are actually killed in these attacks, tells me that there really aren't that many attacks that, there are, that have been foiled. If there were a lot of successes, if there were a lot of achievements that they could point to, they would be pointing to them. They would be waving the names from the rooftops. They would be telling us about them nonstop to get more budget funding and more power to monitor what we do in our daily lives. And the fact that they don't have that, that the fact that they don't have those names to be able to wave in front of Congress and everybody else to get this power tells me that uh, they don't even believe their own nonsense. Well, thank you. <laughs> 